Welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to be taking a look at a long-forgotten Garth Ennis Steve Dillon masterpiece. But first, we have to let you guys know, Cartoonist Kayfabe Tober prompt list is available. Take your little screen grab, go on to the Cartoonist Kayfabe Instagram. We pinned it to the top of our profile there. These are your prompts to draw in October. A lot of makers in the in the audience Make sure you tag us and add us in uh, those prompts so that we can repost uh, as much of that material as possible. It's always fun to see what the kayfabe audience comes up with. We have a Patreon, and at the Patreon, you can uh, pledge support to Cartoonist Kayfabe and get all the videos before anybody else. The King Kayfabers are chilling in the uh, live stream recording session that we have going on right at this very minute. And they're getting everything before anybody else mitigates the kayfabe effect. And this might be a kayfabe affected book. Uh, what I mean by that is our guys are getting uh, the cheapest copies that you're going to find online. We have 1,500 or more videos on the channel right now as we speak. And we might have talked about some of your favorites. So hit the magnifying glass on the front page of the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Give a search of your favorite titles and your favorite comics. Uh, we might have talked about this stuff. Check out those videos. Without further ado, Jimmy, let's take a look at Heartland. Uh, Garth Ennis, Steve Dillon from the creators of Preacher. We have the spell One Shot. And uh, I always heard that this was a, kind of an adjacent Hellblazer uh, comic. But there's no John Constantine, as the, as the Brits call him, uh, in here at all. This is... There's no uh, supernatural horror... Well, maybe horror. <laughs> uh, but, but it's very much... This is a slice of life story. Yeah, uh, all the all the writers who have some affinity for good dialogue and voices and things, they all want to do their like my dinner with Andre kind of comic. Uh, you'll hear Ann Nocenti talk about that with uh, Chris Claremont. Like like uh, man, he just didn't want any fight scenes or anything like that. He just if he could have had a situation where it's just a Thanksgiving uh, dinner <laughs> with the X Men. He would do that. And Garth Ennis, certainly his ear for dialogue is very complimentary to my interests. So uh, it makes for a really fascinating read. But uh, I didn't know anything about this. I didn't know where this was going. We were taking a look at a Wizard magazine and uh, this was on like, you know, the good and cheap or uh, outstanding new titles. One of those kinds of uh, little, you know, Reader's Digest kind of synopsises. I had this laying uh, in in my stacks as a future episode. Never read it, and uh, you you mentioned it at one point. So I, I it picked be... it up not that long ago out of a dollar box. Didn't know anything about it, but saw the creative team like Preacher. It seemed like uh, yeah, I like these one and done issues too. And you don't get a lot of them out of like a Marvel DC catalog. So it's kind of neat when one when you come across one. I got a lot out of uh, reading this comic, but I do think that you might get even more. If you read it more than once, uh, it begins with these kind of drunkards sitting around passing a bottle, just talking about, you know, the, the, the town, I guess they're in Belfast. And this is, this is like the IRA era where bombings occur. This might even be a bombed out piece of rubble that, you know, claimed a body or two that they're sitting on getting drunk on. Talking about the townspeople, we've seen that guy just kind of walk by, and uh, our townie with the mustache is a little bit more in the know. They're back and forth. It's like classic, uh, it's like classic Garth Ennis, but also it's that era where Tarantino is fresh out and has that kind of way with words that has a little bit of toughness. You know, it's El Elmore Leonard, that kind of hard scrabble. Uh, down in the trenches kind of kind of dialogue. I'll add one more to it. This is 1997 publication date, I believe. Think of like the alternative comics that were the slice of life. I think of like Ed Brubaker's Low Life, you know, going to a party at night and stuff. And we're going to see them go out and have drinks and stuff at night. It's really interesting to think how this kind of lines up with the alternative comics of the 90s. It's the same concept. Yeah. It's a bunch of, it's character based, you know, it's family and friends based. It's like history of the family members getting into it and stuff. I mean, those are things, if all you had was that description, very easily that could have been a drawn in quarterly book 
a fan of graphics book, something like that, of just like a cartoonist kind of getting into his family background and fights with his siblings and, you know, a new, a new partner showing up, you know, like it's, it's very much a slice of life comic. It just happens to be delivered through this assembly line system that is Marvel DC and, you know, having a, a team of people creating it rather than one, one person. Yeah, absolutely, man. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the books that we make, and we have a lot of stuff coming out in the very near future. Uh, sooner than later, in mid-October, comes the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus for the 10-year anniversary of my Hip Hop Family Tree series. After that comes X-Men Grand Design Trilogy, which collects all three volumes of my X-Men Grand Design comics. There are two trades of Red Room out there right now. Anti-social network and trigger warnings, but the third, uh, called Crypto Killers, is coming out in January. Jimmy's been self-publishing uh, some comics and magazines lately. Uh, the Black and White Zine, 1986 Zine, and True Crime Funnies are coming to you uh, sooner than later. October, what date? 26. 26 is going to be a sale at his website. Make sure you jump on that. Finite copies available. Street Angel, Princess of Poverty is coming to you in November, it is a companion piece to the Street Angel Deadly Scroll Alive trade paperback. And before you is a bibliography of all the stuff that we have on the stands to date. Now let's get back to the video. Garth Ennis, he has a little afterword in the back and describes that he wrote this thing in like 94. Uh, so he was sitting on this comic for a little while. And I don't know that it was just a one and done comic that could have been an independent comic. But he just, you know, he has this, this equity with DC Comics Vertigo at this point. And uh, rather than, I mean, what's what's the indie comic scene like at this point? And, and what's the what's the pay rate? What's the monetization of that? You basically, it's all royalty based. So he and whoever he would collaborate with would probably get peanuts to uh, assemble the comic. He figured out a way to manipulate whatever story he had in mind. Uh, use some kind of satellite character from a Hell, Hellblazer comic. And now, you know, it's it's within that universe. And now you can actually kind of get paid. Hard to imagine another um, Vertigo Marvel DC artist drawing this because it's so important, the expressions and things. And I think it's something Dylan does really well. Yeah. Um, not everybody has that. That's a, that's a pretty high level of skill that he possesses. This is a good example, too. Like, like it feels like that gun is in that guy's back and your body would naturally do that motion. Also, this is the Preacher creative team, but they they have some dimension to their chops, to their craft, and you can imagine what this sequence would look like if it was a Preacher comic, but they decided to go off camera with uh, the violence there. Hmm. And uh, it's a pervert, you know, it's, a, it's some weird stalker incel guy who routinely stalks this lady, watches her in the window, and these guys show up. Uh, you immediately kind of know that they're hoods and stuff and are kind of drumming up an excuse to to fuck this guy up. To kneecap him. Yeah. We they find that out him, later. They accuse him of being a drug dealer. So he, he he apparently maybe isn't really a drug dealer, but the pervert part does ring true. Yeah, no doubt. And and I mean, like it, it's accepted that the guys who shot him are the drug dealers and they are, you know, they're not letting new people pop into their territory. So that was probably the height of the action. Uh, well, no, I guess there's one big climactic piece. But now we have our, uh, you know, our, our our main characters. Family dynamics up. now. The real violence starts. Yeah. And there's... I th one, one of the reasons why I think it requires a couple of rereads is because there's this backdrop of, of Belfast and, and uh, the kind of accepted... Uh, the accepted new normal of like what Belfast is at that time with soldiers and guys with guns who have, have to keep their eyes out. But everybody who lives in a town is uh, very comfortable with that. And I think it's almost like there's a kind of a cold war, not, but not like Russia, America, just like in the true sense of like what the word means. And that kind of exists within this family and it will blow up at a certain point. Uh, I think that there probably might be some subtle significance to the fact that she's a brunette and the these are twins and they have like a lighter color hair, which would suggest that either they took on more of like mom or dad's traits or maybe they have different dads. Yeah, there's stuff even about their names and like having a name that sounds Catholic right. or, you know, Protestant or, you know, and how that that is something they live with, you know, like how that's 
yeah, it's it's wild. It's so hard to imagine this not living there. Yeah, but... Uh, Which also kind of is what appeals to me about a comic like this. You know, like, I couldn't write this comic. No, totally. And... And this makes it clear enough as as time goes on. At first, you read ten pages, you don't know exactly like where are we going with this. Uh, it it becomes clear over time. It it sort of illuminates things as as we go. But it's never it's never unclear. The dialogue is always snappy. It's never boring. Uh, it is revealed that uh, our guy uh, our pervert guy got kneecapped. It is the the guy who's been kind of harassing our our main girl for quite some time and she's trying to put a put a stop to it yeah she is not there to make him feel better right and even at the and uh i mean i didn't mean uh the bit about it being better that they'd killed you i meant the rest and with that smile and that look it's okay kathy i know he didn't get anything she blew hot air yeah do we ever come back to him uh i i don't think so it's funny going through this again, and it, it probably would benefit from multiple reads, but going through it again and trying to think about some of these threads that maybe don't connect. Right. Yeah, and uh, this is a good seek, a good spread to uh, communicate that. Uh, I, I like that the flashback is done with panel borders and color palette. So we see these moments, and it looks like pretty harrowing moments. Uh so that's evocative, you know, that gets into your mind and you're like, okay, well, what was that moment? Clearly we have like one major moment that was transformative in these characters' lives, but we're bringing uh, a new sibling, a younger sibling into the mixture with her boyfriend who has the Mike Tyson moon part. But you, when you look at that, man, you got, you got to kind of think of like young Jesse Custer, even though that's a girl. Yeah, big time. <laughs> That's a heavy lifting piece for an artist to, to be doing flashbacks of these characters, but you want to be able to identify them in like one panel. Yeah. That's a lot to ask. Yeah. He, he made it happen. He does. And, and uh, Ennis, the eyes are easily identifiable. The eyeballs are easily identifiable as, as, uh, as Dylan, but he's able to change these proportions and uh, the, the noses and, and the, the face shapes to give you these subtle differences in character. He's always excelled at that. Look at the space game of these three panels. You know, like, it really is like actors sitting around, and then your camera just kind of, like, slightly resetting for each of those panels, but, like, all the space is consistent. Right. Uh, not not too many writers in, in comics have the ability to carry a story through dialogue in this way. Uh it, it, you run the risk of be, being very boring. Uh, this, this is a visual medium, you know? And uh, to do your My Dinner with Andre sequence, like, uh, you, 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 need, you need real pros. And Ennis and Dylan, they, for, fewer people could, could, uh, could accomplish what they accomplish on the uh, comic page. Yeah, again, especially in the mainstream. Uh, we have this dynamic between Bernadette and her boyfriend. Uh, she is going to visit an aunt. She knows that those aunts are those, like, old school type uh, family members that have uh, racist, racism built into their their ideology so might be a little dicey to bring the dude to uh to that area so he's going to hang back with the family here while she goes out there to go visit the uh the uncle and aunt yeah and a real coolness between bernadette and kathy the old sister and the young sister right which we'll get into more we will the boyfriend character seems to uh gel really well with the family like the one brother is uh the drunkard of the of the crew and is like let's go get pissed uh so the boyfriend he's new to this area so he's the cipher for us in this town uh that now has military vehicles coming through uh it actually it made me think about when i um when i went to angolem it was right after the uh like the charlie hebdo stuff went down and when i'm in paris there were these soldiers who you know as say a 34 35 year old guy however old i was uh, having these 18 year old boys who weren't using proper gun safety kind of uh, positioning and I'm looking down the barrel of a gun as they're walking by me with their little short shorts on you know looking at girls and it did not make me feel safe 
it made me feel real nervous. Yeah, I remember right after 9-11 flying and seeing, like, the machine gun soldiers in the airports and just being like, wow. Yeah. You know, like, holding their gun, you know. It was different. I mean, I guess we get used to it over time. But what a great panel for, like, focal point. Everybody's looking one direction except for our guy who's new to the scene. You go right to his gaze and what he's looking at and, you know, what he's looking at is right in the foreground. There are a lot of these moments in this comic that you could almost teach a course on panel composition and things for storytelling right. and i think this panel is one of the great examples of that there'll be a couple of exam examples further of our guy interacting with this area and it's a it's several conversations about just how this is life this is what it is we're used to it and i do think that there's some connection with everything that they're saying in relation to their family dynamic. Yeah. That's why it requires that, that extra reading to just... Maybe you could pull exactly those points. And that could also be up for to uh, the kayfabers who might know this uh, story a little bit more intimately. Here we have the kind of fuck-up brother who uh, got fired from a job and explaining the whole situation. And, and this is the world that he has... That these people live in. Okay, so this is just going along with what our guy saw earlier. He's taken a poop... At, at the office, got headphones on when an R2-D2 from the bomb squad comes through because a suspicious package was seen in the in the building, but it turned out to be his kind of ham sandwich or something. You got the bomb squad guys that look nearly Kirby-ish. You know, they look like sci-fi characters. And I think that they're, they're drawn with that intention to kind of look like, like alien forms or something. How bad is your day when you have to put on that bomb suit? Yeah can't imagine but that's you speaking as cartoonist i think those guys are gi joes man and they're like yes let's do it just like the firemen and shit <laughs> and then uh just go into a bar and there's some bullshit going down there but the people who are from that town it's it's nothing to them they're just like well whatever <laughs> yeah it's funny there we just spent how many pages talking about violence you know and it's and it's kind of on this like national level but you're walking down a street and it's like here we go two guys that are ready to go at it that's the south side in pittsburgh man yes. on, on bar night put some trash on the street <laughs> and a crying girl with a broken heel on every corner and even when they go to go get something as simple as some french fries uh they gotta you know there are some soldiers there with machine guns and stuff so so this is life in belfast at this m moment in time do they say where bernadette's boyfriend's from yeah, he I says think, bloody hell. So yeah, I think it's like London proper. Okay. And so, like, you have the relationship of, uh, of, the, of, you know, London, England with Ireland, you know, helping to create a lot of uh, this, this kind of tension in the country. Here's our flashback sequence here. Uh, and the boyfriend, he gets, he gets along famously with the family. Everybody digs him. See, like this moment right here, I think that that's a very telling kind of set of facial expression that we see there. Yeah, is that bedroom eyes? That's bedroom eyes, man. She's, she's, uh, you know, you want your woman to be able to look at you like that. Sleeping on the floor. And they might even be talking about, oh yeah, I don't want to throw you out of your bed. See, yeah, this really does require that second reading. Mm -hmm. And the, and the backstory here is the girlfriend, her sister, Kathy's sister, never talks about her. You know, they have this very bad relationship, the two sisters. Right. And uh, let's let's explore where that kind of come, comes from. Sure, here we go. Flashback sequence. We got a younger Bernadette, and it's cool, right? This is something that uh, Dylan excels at, and he's done it in Preacher a lot, where you have the different ages of Jesse Custer and his mother and stuff. Got some lineage, got some lineage, got some lineage. You take the lineage out, you got a younger girl. Nearly the same hair. It is a different hairstyle and stuff. But you know that this is her. You take the lines out. That's that old cartooning rule, right? Like, the more lines you put on the face, the more age you add. But then we have our twin siblings here. Girl has longer hair, and the the boy has uh, no ability to grow facial hair, some, some pimples and things. And they're twins, unlike any other twins I've ever known, in that they're contentious, and that they fight with one another. Mm. Uh, I've never seen that. I've known, known a 
couple of sets of twins throughout my life, and that, that's ne that's never been the case. Yeah, we have new twins in my neighborhood, and they get along so far. Yeah, I'll keep you guys up to date on it. We'll check back in in fifteen years. It's always Tomax and Zaymont, man. <laughs> but here's our youngest sister. Yeah, little Bernadette, waiting for Daddy to come home, drunk oh. after a uh, typical night out. Yeah, and you know what, man? Like this, this thing rings so close to home. Not not with my personal nuclear family, but I have some friends who. Uh, you know the little the girl who was the youngest and the like the least kind of aware of of the this hardcore shit that was going on such daddy's girl and like the dad total fucking piece of shit to the point of like having to go to jail and stuff and uh the, you know the rest of the family completely outside of his influence whatsoever yeah this this one really really kind of struck close to home because the guy's, you know, he's a drunkard, he's he's a schmuck, he's an asshole. He dotes on the little baby, but everybody else kind of be damned. And uh, and you you see that a lot. You know, that's, that's people, that's even, you know, uh, people who have pets or like that. Or like, you know, the puppy could do no wrong, but then, you know, as the puppy grows up, yeah, you, you, you lose the interest. Great with the facial expressions, too, because that's the ultimate split, right? The mom and the dad. Absolutely. And uh, once again, another strength of Steve Dillon is making these characters, they look like a family, you know? Like, some of the characters have a little bit of mom face. Some of them have a dad face. You could thank the colorist for coloring the hairs all the same. But the mom and the dad completely going at it. And, and this is not... This is not a one-dimensional sort of a Silver Age Marvel comic where the dad is like purely evil, the mom is purely good. The mom's going to be talking about like what a great man he was and like how amazing he was when they got married and and all that sort of stuff. And and, and tells tells a uh, Kit, I believe, Kathy. Uh, don't don't marry a dude that like like me. I wonder how much of this story is set up as like this interior of this house and the history is basically a retelling of the of the Irish conflict, but you know made local. Yeah, because you you see them fighting here about the importance of names, right? And you know she's trying to push off that history while he's clinging to it, and she's saying that's why we continue in this situation that we're in, right? And as a backdrop for the story, the, the dad just recently passed away. That's that's why everybody's kind of getting together. So now we got we got Kit, Kathy, and the boyfriend character alone, on their own, making time, getting to know one another. I can almost imagine it being a play. Yeah. You know, two characters sitting on a bench here just talking. Ennis can do hyperbole, and he could do these human moments, too. And for all intents and purposes, to if we're, if we're speaking in superhero comics parlance, uh, Kathy is our protagonist, and she doesn't do a, a, a nice thing, you know, which also speaks to that multidimensionality of the characters. Yeah, no great people in this comic. Or at just, least just no, people, uh, just no humans. flawless people, right? Yeah, just, just humans, man. People make mistakes and life is complicated. Another great, great panel. He says, so you don't mind fooling around with your sister's boyfriend? And she says, I don't like my sister. What's your excuse? Right. Oof. Good stuff. Yeah, Hum man. That's human nature. <laughs> really well represented in one panel. And when you have, you know, a family drama, you got to get that family back uh, right at the most inopportune time. And not only does the little sister see it, but everybody sees it. So you have that moment of of uh, being surprised by our characters engaging in their infidelities. You have the other people who... You get the sense that maybe they were watching it for a couple seconds. You know, they they might have been standing there. They, they, they've they went through the surprise part of the emotion already and are kind of, like, more disappointed. Uh, we see Bernadette, none too happy. And here we go. The brother reads the room well and is like, well, let's go get a drink, fellas. You know, that feels like uh, like the child, the PS, PTSD child, too. You know, like, what's his role in all of this? Try to try, like try to avoid the the violence. Try to lighten the mood. Try to do anything. Right, and it's also a thing where like uh, a conversation needs to be had. So uh, we've got to clear 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 the room out a little bit, and now we jump back to 
the uh, crying Bernadette face that we saw earlier with the, the kind of flashback color with that wine color and the gray colors. We're, we're getting back into that mode. And you can see that with these characters. We got the young twin siblings again. We got Bernadette with like, the, I mean, the uh, Kathy with the pulled back kind of hair rather than the, the part on the side. And we have the drunk dad coming home a little hammered, spills tea on himself and blames it on the mom. The mom makes a little joke about the pops that that probably any uh, sort of normal dad will probably just like laugh off. But this guy, emasculated. Hardcore. Gives the old lady a damn headbutt. A nosebreaker. Punches the kid in the stomach. Because the kid has to come to defend, uh, defend the mom, man. Oof. Yeah, horrible scene. And now we see Kathy come in. The oldest sister is going to try to stop this with her own violence. And probably, you know, the most capable character uh, in, in the situation and probably feels super responsible for uh, for the family. The, the mom is already whittled down to a nub. The kids are too little to do anything. So, you know, she's she's earning her position in, in, in the family. Jabs them with a, like, a, like a bread knife. It is what it is. So it's a blunt, blunt bitch. How about Steve Dillon, man? Whenever it's time to like ramp things up, quite a range of what he can do with a human face. Totally. She says, I wish I would have stuck that knife through your heart. And then we got that exact camera angle. Leave my daddy alone. Little Bernadette who, who gets doted on by the drunken dad who doesn't quite understand all of the uh, turmoil that he's putting the rest of the family through. And we see that that is where this this is kind of main source of uh, the dynamic, and and it goes to the point where uh, Bernadette, modern day, are you determined to wreck my life? She says, "Man." Yeah, practically blames the older sister for uh, killing the dad. Yeah. Spits on her face. And then we get into a place where uh, our protagonist does another thing that's that's uh, not nice. That goes against uh, any kind of protagonist instinct. Uh, and she basically lies to the girl to just <laughs> make her feel bad, saying that... Uh, uh, wasn't there something about some sort of maybe like a... Oh, yeah, that... that uh, that the mom got like one raped within the marriage, right? And that's that's why you're here, which turns out not to be true. She admits it to somebody else, but that she was just trying to hurt this person, which happens in arguments if you don't put yourself in check, if you get too emotional. Yeah, especially arguments with loved ones. It's not like this is the random person you're yelling at in, in the South Side. Right. This is the, we grew up together, let me stick the knife in and twist. I know you're Achilles Hill. I know it, and I'm going to tell you it. And it, it look effective, you know. Moment of silence. The girl skedaddles, and then we cut to the dudes, and the dudes get kind of get it. The brother, my brother's like, ah, there's going to be hell to pay. Uh, you get the sense that there's some remove from Bernadette with him, also. You know, laughing and joking with this guy. Yeah, it does seem like all the older siblings... Like, Bernadette's on an island. Yeah. You know, they were all there, and I think they all recognized the dad as being shit. Right. Except for her. And you catch your whippings, you know? Like, uh, if you catch your whipping from, from, from that dad, like, that that can put you in a in a mind state. And, you know, she probably never, never got one. And then you have this boyfriend character who's kind of like a third wheel. Kinda, you know, he's not a blood relative. He's just kind of outside. And, and he's like... A real piece of shit. Maybe even we saw Kathy have the conversation with the mom. Don't date somebody. Don't ever be involved with somebody like your dad. And this guy's pretty close to the dad. You know, like maybe mom did not have that conversation with that daughter. And then we realized that, uh, you know, he he's has his own infidelity. So, you know... He's the biggest kind of piece of shit that's like very clear. There's like no redeeming quality. And then at the end, you discover that not only, you know, is there infidelity there, but like it's already known. Like, you know, the wife know knows it. 
This is this is good sibling stuff too. And here are the twins, by the way. Like they're they're pretty close. They may fight a little bit whenever they were in those flashbacks or whatever, but you see them as like besties. Right. Uh, but they're they're joking around about her bringing her Claire bringing her boyfriend out, <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> "If you promise not to not to try and get with them." <laughs> That feels real to me in terms of characters, like whether it's good friends or family, where it's like you just you just can't let it go, but you also get a little extra leeway too. Right, and uh, we have our kind of thematic uh, mirroring uh, of our opening sequence and our way to get out of this comic with those kind of R two D two C three P O guys uh, who are kind of uh, the Uatu, the watchers of of this sleepy little town. I uh, can't sleep on the ad for Unknown Soldier because this, I guess, is probably the height of uh, Garth Ennis's powers, man. Uh, Preacher is running on high, and he's just able to make make deals, man. He was making a lot of deals and doing a lot of work for them. You know, he did so well for that brand that whatever stuff he was coming up with and pitching, he was getting those opportunities. And then our drunkards have their little argument. We leave our guy, and then he's like, he's a... T- takes a nap on that on that rubble, mm. and then it's the uh, the end note from Garth Ennis uh, on the last page, kind of describing the the changes that Belfast made just while he wrote this comic. Like when he first wrote it, it was already in the midst of like bombings happening every once in a while and a lot of kind of strife. Then the comic was set to come out and then there was like, you know, ceasefires and truces that were announced. But then at the writing of the end note piece, it's slowly getting back to those days. And he just, he cannot wrap his mind around it because like, why would you not want peace? Wasn't it nice that we had a couple of years where things were relatively really, really cool and chill and awesome uh, so, but we're going to, you know, we want some excitement. We want to get back to that nonsense. I feel like that rings true. Yeah, it's a, it's quite a snapshot of a different time too. You know, pre-internet, pre-social media, it's always strange to think of like Belfast as doing this in the nineties. I had a lit teacher in college that went to Ireland uh, one summer for, you know, just, just to visit. I mean, it's this great literary tradition that, that the Irish have and uh, did a bus tour through Belfast, but it was while it was kind of like, this was still a risk, oh, you know, totally. like it was still kind of a very hairy thing that he would do that, um, you know, and talked about being kind of afraid whenever he was do- that part of the trip and stuff. And it's just like, one, it's not long ago, you know, like I'm in college at that age, you oh, know, I'm yeah. 20, whenever this stuff is kind of winding down. And I mean, it's it's Ireland. It's not like something we think of certain parts of the world and we just kind of go, that's, you know, it's the Middle East, you know, there's constant fighting or conflict. But you don't think about that in like East, uh, Western Europe. Right. Yeah, not really, in the modern day. Really, really kind of wild. And for DC to do a book like this at that time, it's shocking to me. You yeah. know, I said at the top of this video, like I'm kind of surprised this book exists. I can't imagine DC publishing a book like this today seems really edgy and you think of garth ennis and the stuff that he writes and in some ways this is probably the most like on the edge in a lot of ways even though there's nothing supernatural or even overly violent in this comic but it just feels like kind of a shocking book yeah the vertigo imprint and what karen berger kind of established over time um the subtleties of the human experience would would come into those comics, you know. And Neil Gaiman explored ideas of you know trans rights and things thirty years before the conversation hit hit a wider stage. And uh, it would be a place where you would find people of different kinds of sexualities within these titles, uh, just kind of you know a step up from your superhero fare. Uh, in terms of the nature of these characters, what they experience, what they go through, closer to quote-unquote real. But this feels like a very strong slice-of-life human drama. Once again, no, you, know, you saw it. No no real um, supernatural elements in here at all. I don't think he would have been able to sell this if it wasn't for the success of Preacher, because you put the names much bigger than anything. 
Uh, I think that Karen Berger might have uh, instructed them to like kind of tweak the idea a little bit and just get one fucking Hellblazer character in there to say in the Diamond Book that this is a you know a, a satellite Hell Hellblazer comic. Uh, so I think that administratively some things had to be done to make this comic possible. Also, by it, the way, that's the two kind of uh, it's the two kind of Irish people you got too. You got kind of the gingers and then you got the, like the black haired ones. Um, I think it it, it kind of speaks to on a larger landscape of DC Comics. There is no place for a book like this at DC. You know, it's not like they're publishing original graphic novels of this sort or anything. Like they've completely kind of shut this part off of like a, a creator doing something that's a very personal work and a and a work that is creator owned. Yeah. You know, like that stuff has really just gone away yeah. and DC had a few different ways that they used to do that. And now that stuff, I, they don't do anything like that now. Yeah. 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 Good call, man. Yeah. It's all IP form stuff at this point. Fun to look at. Fun to Interesting uh, comic. It has been collecting dust in my back issues for 15 or 20 years, man. So it was fun to kind of dust off and give it a look. Cause you know, you look through it and you're like, Hey man, it just looks like a bunch of talking heads. But when you really crack it open, uh, it's a very meaningful comic and, story yeah i think there's a lesson too of you get this uh success that that ennis and dylan had what do you do with it you know right. push your chips in the middle and go for it now and then and i feel like this is a comic where like you've earned a chance to do something different and, and take a swing and they go for it we should all we should all uh, t- take take Absolutely. that lesson lesson to heart kayfabe tober is upon us here is your drawing prompt list make sure that you uh screen grab it and also make sure that you, uh, if you're participating and you're going to draw from these prompts, that you tag us on social media uh, with your drawings so that we can uh, reshare as many of these as possible. We're a daily YouTube stream here at Cartoonist Kayfabe, and we have about 1,500 videos that are out there right now, including a lot of uh, Preacher talk. Uh, there might even be a, a, a playlist for Preacher, I think. Uh, so take a look through the channel. Uh, probably will be easier to search if you hit the magnifying glass and type in your favorite titles check out those episodes if we haven't talked about your favorite comics yet please let us know in the comments below and we will push those comics a little bit higher on our to read piles the king kayfabers on our patreon are able to get access to all of our videos before anybody else so nobody's been thinking about heartland and i bet you you could find some copies on uh, amazon and ebay but you might not be able to now because the King K Fabers have snapped those up. So uh, participating and uh, endorsing Cartoonist K Fab with a King K Faber subscription can uh, can pay for itself. But ultimately, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make. And Jimmy, I want you to tell the people right now what you have forthcoming. Yeah, what I need you guys to do is hit your local comic shops and pre-order Street Angel Princess of Poverty. This will be out in November, but pre-orders are due now. Let them know you want a copy. This collects all of my Street Angel comics that are not in Deadliest Girl Alive, also available from Image Comics. Get both books, and you will have a set of Street Angel for the first time under uh, one publishing banner. Should look good on your shelf, but you got to let them know that you want a copy of Street Angel Princess of Poverty now while you still can. Uh, I have been self-publishing lately. You see the BW zine on the left, the celebration of the black and white explosion comics of the 80s, a huge inspiration for me more and more as I go forward and making my own stuff. Uh, 1986 zine, celebrating the biggest year in comics history. This is the uh, when comic shops take over from the newsstands. This is Dark Knight, Mouse, Watchmen, all kinds of incredible stuff in 1986. And True Crime Funnies, three nonfiction stories, including a couple of wrestling yarns. These will all be available if you don't have a copy. They will be available October 26th on jimrug.com. Kind of a big fall holiday sales push that I'm going to do there. Uh, Keep following along and uh, be first in line on October 26th because I do have finite copies of all of this stuff. The time is now, uh, and we do have finite copies of the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus that are out there in the wild. About 75% of this print run have been accounted for uh, by customers and readers at this point. And it's the best book I've made to date. And I really wish that uh, you would put it on your uh, library shelf uh, as well. Uh, 10 year anniversary of Hip Hop Family Tree. It's the 50th anniversary of hip hop as a culture. So we had to do it up in the biggest way uh, possible with 150 pages of additional materials. And uh, I hope you put this on your bookshelf this holiday season, October 18th. This comes out uh, maybe four weeks later in November comes the X-Men Grand Design 
uh, trade paperback that collects all three X-Men Grand Design books that I put together inside of one handy uh, hardcover. And some of these are out of print, so please uh, put your name on one of these because, who knows, Marvel might uh, put one printing of that trilogy out and that'll be it. So make sure you put your name down for one of those. And Red Room has been the current focus uh, for my comics work the past couple of years. Two trade paperbacks exist right now, the Anti-Social Network and Trigger Warnings, but uh, the third trade paperback called Crypto Killers comes out in January. Uh, so please claim your copy as soon as possible. Use your Christmas loot to snap it up and uh, you know complete the Red Room trilogy of horror comics. Murder on the Dark Web for fun and profit. Jimmy, the books are the most important part to keep the channel floating. Would you agree? Yes. But there are some other ways to support the channel. Let the people know. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. That'll keep you up to date on everything we have going on, where we're appearing, things of that nature. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, stickers, and lots more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video in the show notes. All good ways to support the channel. Jimmy, please give the people their final marching orders and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.